I want to thank you for joining me for this Wednesday evening service of First Baptist Church in Leesdale, Mississippi. We appreciate those of you who watch these videos, whether you're a person who's home and you're shut in and you can't get out, or you're a person who's watching from one of our surrounding communities or just one of the people who likes to follow the Wednesday night services of First Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us. We much prefer to have you in person, but we'll continue to make these videos for those of you who can't come. Tonight's message comes from Psalm 74. It's just a little bit different than what we normally look at on Wednesday night, and to me, it's timely for us as we consider what's going on in our country, and we, as we also have to take a look at what's going on in our own lives. The title of the message uh, comes from the first verse of Psalm 74, and one word in that verse. I'll show you that in just a minute. But the title of the message is Smoke Rising. Let me tell you that in, in the Old Testament, there came a time when Jerusalem was destroyed along with the temple. The lamentations of Jeremiah bewailed the horrors of that time in the lives of those who were left behind. But there were others who were not left behind. There were others who, as part of that battle that, that destroyed Jerusalem, there were others who were simply carried away into captivity. These are people that you know about in the Bible, people like Daniel, people like Ezra, people like Nehemiah. Also, Esther was one of those people. They simply went into captivity. It was a sad time in the lives of God's people. I often like to review Nehemiah's journey back to Jerusalem. It came near the end of that 70-year captivity, and, and even at that time, uh, most of the city was still in ruins and the situation was dire. That The ruins of Jerusalem and, and that season of captivity reminded them, especially reminded Nehemiah, of a ruin of their own souls and their captivity to sin and to Satan and their desperate need of restoration. In Psalm 74, which we're going to look at in just a moment, God's people had the sense that they had come under God's hand of discipline. They were not forgotten by God, mind you, but they had been rejected for a time, forsaken for a time, and left in the rubble and ruin caused by the consequences of their own sin. Now, I've divided this message into some major sections. Here's the first major section that will occur even before we look at the first verse. God will allow the destruction of his work when that work has been forsaken by his people, he will allow our hopes to fail, our hearts to fail, so that we will see that our only hope is in him. Now, this psalm must have been written, Psalm 74, when the, when the whole situation was still fresh. Maybe the smoke was still rising from the ruins. Maybe the marks of the enemy invasion, along with the flag of the conqueror, still flew from the temple mount in the sight of the people. We begin reading in verse one, and that's all I'm gonna read right now is just verse one. As the psalmist writes, O oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? He speaks of a smoldering anger in the heart of God. When sin simmers in the hearts of God's people, Fire burns in the heart of God. Now, I may not see that smoke rising in heaven, but I may see it rising from, some, from the ashes of some area in my life where God has lifted his hand to discipline me as a reminder of whose I am. There are some words from Isaiah that were also written in this same period of captivity when God's people were coming to grips with why things were the way they were in their lives. Listen to Isaiah 64, verses 8 through 12. Isaiah writes, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. All of us are the work of your hand. 
Do not be angry with us beyond measure, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Behold, look now, all of us are your people, but your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire and all our precious things have become a ruin. Will you restrain yourself at these things? O oh Lord, will you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? You see the feeling they had in their lives of this discipline of God. They looked at the smoke rising and they said, this is God's work. This is, this is God's discipline in our life. Is it so in your life? Their lives were a smoking ruin. Their temple was a smoking ruin. Their city was a smoking ruin. In the words of Isaiah, and these are words that have always gripped me, all our precious things have become a ruin. Has, here's the second division. Has something precious in your life become a ruin? Your life, your future, a son, a daughter? Is smoke rising from some area of your life? And could it be due to your own broken relationship with God? In Psalm 74, verse 2, the psalmist said, Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance, and this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. You see, the, the mark of God's ownership was on their life. They knew they belonged to him. Do you know that you belong to him? Haven't you been purchased by his blood? Aren't you his child? Why then does it seem to you on occasion that your heavenly father has abandoned you, rejected you? That's a good question to ask, is it not? Has he turned his face away from you? Is there an emptiness in your spirit? Is there a loneliness in your soul? Does it appear to you that God has withdrawn his hand of blessing from your life or from your church or that you are under God's hand of judgment? The time comes when God's people as a whole need to cry out to him with one voice, remember your congregation, just as they did in the 74th Psalm. They acknowledged that Mount Zion was once the place of God's presence and power. You will remember in the book of Isaiah that there was a time, if you go back to the sixth chapter of Isaiah, you'll see there was a time in Isaiah's life when he saw smoke rising from the glory of God's presence in the temple. But now smoke was rising for a different reason. The place that was once a, a place of God's presence now lay in ruins as a perpetual testimony to God's absence. Uh, then comes the plea in Psalm 74, 3. Turn your footsteps toward the perpetual ruins. The enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary. Do you ever get the sense about that in the church? That there's just something wrong? That the enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary? He's touched every body. He's touched every life. He's touched the mood. He's touched the attitudes. He's damaged everything. Of course, they were talking about the beauty of God's house and its furnishings, but they were also talking about their own lives and their own families. Have you ever turned your face away from one of your children in disgust at their behavior? Have you ever left them in their room and locked the door so that they would feel your distance as well as your displeasure? Well, God does the same thing to us until we can stand it no longer, until we cry out, O oh Lord God of hosts, restore us. Turn your face toward us. Turn your feet and face toward our sanctuary. Shine your presence on us and show us your presence and power. What is God's work? without him? What can be accomplished without him? I wish I could say that there were many times over recent years when like Isaiah and in, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, I was overcome 
by God's presence and power in the church. But I have to say that more often than not across the past years, I have been overcome and overwhelmed by a sense of his absence. God withdrew his presence from his people long before the Temple Mount became a smoking ruin, but his people didn't sense it. They couldn't perceive it. But after 70 years in captivity, they knew it. They became painfully aware, aware of, of his absence. Isn't it often the case that we are guilty of the same error of perception? Here's the third division. We have no sense of God's absence or of the departure of his presence until we find ourselves standing in the smoking ruin of some area of our lives. And we will not pray until we smell the smoke and see the rubble. As the people of God in this community, have we lost our passion for him? Have we, as a church, lost our longing for his glory? Have we begun to salute the flags of the enemy? Is that why smoke is rising from the lives of our children, from marriages, from churches, and from the moral foundation of our nation? In this psalm, God's people acknowledge that the smoke of his anger is rising against the people of his pasture. Let me read you verses 4 through 8 of Psalm 74. Our adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own standards for signs. It seems as if one had lifted up his axe in a forest of trees, and now all its carved work they smash with hatchets and hammers. They have burned your sanctuary to the ground. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name. They said in their heart, let us completely subdue them. They have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. Listen, today we see the smoke rising from ruins and wreckage around our country. We also see it from our own lives. Our nation is headed toward ruin because the lives of God's people are in ruin. Our lives and our churches and our nation is in ruin because of sin. When God is at work in his church, when he is present, the smoke does not rise from the rubble of broken homes and broken hearts. Instead, the smoke of God's glory rises from hearts and lives that have been redeemed. The smoke of heartache doesn't rise from the lives of young people ruined by sin. The smoke of God's glory rises from the lives of young people whose hearts are on fire for God. Here's the next major division. It is absolutely impossible for the work of God to go badly when God is present with his people. When God is present, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. But you let God turn his face away and watch what happens. Today, God's people need to pray. We need to ask, as they did in the 74th Psalm, turn your face toward the perpetual ruins. A perpetual ruin is all this work will be without God. It is all your life will be without God. That is all your family will be without the blessing of God's presence. What happens when God withdraws his presence from his people? Look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there among us who knows how long. What does the presence and power of God look like in the church? Well, the very fact that we have to ask that question points to a problem. Isaiah cried out in Isaiah 64, 7, he said, there is no one who calls on your name. There is no one who arouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us over to the power of our iniquities. And so all our precious things have become a ruin 
It affects our lives and our families, our homes, our churches, and our communities. Can you see the smoke rising? Certainly, we need to ask for God's help. The psalmist cried in Psalm 74, verses 10 and 11, How long, Lord, will the enemy mock you? Will the foe revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? They wanted God to do something. They prayed for God to act. Isn't it about time that we ask God to do something, to act, to show his presence and power, first to show it here in our own sanctuary, to show it in our own lives and in our own families so that a watching world and sometimes a mocking world can see God at work? Well, let me read you what Isaiah prayed. And this is one of the most fantastic prayers in all the Bible. He prayed it during this specific time when smoke was rising from the lives of God's people. All their precious things had become a ruin. This begins in Isaiah 63, beginning in verse 15. I'm going to read to Isaiah 64, verse 2. Picture all of this in your mind. The context is set for you. The situation is there. The smoke is rising. And so Isaiah prays, Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation. Where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? The stirring of your heart and your compassion are restrained toward me. For you are our father, although Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us. You, O oh Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from of old is your name. Why, O oh Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Your holy people possessed your sanctuary for a little while, but our adversaries have trodden it down. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who were not called by your name. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence as fire kindles the brushwood uh, and causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations might tremble at your presence. You see, we need to pray for a smoke of a different kind. We need to pray for the rising smoke of God's glory in the midst of his people. We need to pray, oh God, instead of the smoke of trouble, let me see the smoke, the evidence of your presence and power in my life, in my family, and in my church. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down and visit your people. The last statement I want to make comes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Perhaps you know of Spurgeon and his great preaching during the 1800s when he was pastor of the Metropolitan uh, Baptist Church in London. He said, when a church is in a forsaken condition, it must not sit still in apathy, but turn to the hand which smiteth it and humbly inquire the reason why. We need to say, God, why is smoke rising from the ruins in my life, in my church, and in my country? And oh God, bring smoke of a different kind. Let us see the smoke of your glory, the smoke of your greatness, the smoke of your grandeur at work in the midst of your people. Thank you so much for listening.